morning. He is risen. All right. So Jesus Christ's death is both the Paschal sacrifice. What does that mean? The Paschal sacrifice. The Paschal is the lamb that was sacrificed at Passover. It was called the Paschal lamb. So Jesus Christ's death is the Paschal sacrifice, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And it is the sacrifice of the new covenant. What is a covenant? A covenant is a special kind of agreement that makes a new family. We think about covenant, we think about adoption, and we think about marriage, and we think about our faith. Think about baptism. We are brought into the family of God through the new covenant. We're made members of the body of Christ. It restores us to communion with God. The church's teaching on the atonement is consistent with the words of Jesus who said, the son of man came to give his life as a ransom for many. And so today we remember that Jesus gave his life for us. That Jesus died for our sins. We remember this, but that's only half the story. What's the other half of the story? He rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. The tomb is empty. After the eight o'clock mass, a number of people came up to me and said, oh, Father James, this homily was so good. It was so good. I said, Father James, what did you talk about? You know, he said, I just told him the tomb is empty. And if the tomb isn't empty, then our faith fades away to nothingness. And we must believe that the tomb is empty, that Christ rose from the dead. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the Holy Spirit. He was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He rose from the dead. So today we celebrate that great event, our Lord Jesus rising from the dead. And why was he put to death in the first place? It's another thing we have to kind of step back and ask. Sin has consequences. As surely as two plus two equals four, so sin has consequences. And the wages of sin is death. And our Lord Jesus took upon himself the death of the world. Sin has the consequences of disease and divorce and division, and deceit, and death. This power that seeks to oppress and kill. But today is Easter day, and he is risen, he is risen indeed. Notice the present tense, he is risen, he is alive. This is the most basic and fundamental truth of our faith. Jesus is risen, the tomb is empty. As Christians, we rejoice for Jesus is our Lord, God is our King. Death does not reign, but God reigns. The Paschal mystery, the suffering death and resurrection of our Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I say this, I say this, this is not the first Easter I have said this. I wish I could tell you what it's like to be a Christian. I cannot tell you. You have to live it yourself. It is an understood life. It is a life of joy. It is a life of hope. It is a life that embraces the difficulty and challenges that are sure to come. It is a life that recognizes that in spite of it all, God wins. The tomb is empty. Jesus is risen. I can't tell you that you have to experience that if I say it, it's just empty words. But you can know it. You can live it. You can share it. You can be transformed by it. Christ has won. Today, death seeks, death seeks, Jesus wins. But while Jesus won, we cannot succumb to a theology of what we call, or sometimes is called in the modern world, cheap grace. Grace was not cheap. 
it was bought for a price, and the price was the precious blood of the Lamb. Grace is not cheap. Some people say, once you know Christ, you can even sin and sin boldly. But I say, once you know Christ, you have no desire to sin. Once you know Christ, you want to be transformed by him. Christianity is not an idea. It's not a set of rules. It's an encounter with a living person. It's an encounter with a risen Christ who is alive. Lent, the season of Lent we just finished, tells us about trials. It tells us about fasting. It tells us about the cross. It tells us about scourging and spitting and slapping and persecution and crucifixion. Lent tells us all of those things, and they are still part of this life. We cannot pretend they're not. We know they are. We live it. We experience it. We suffer from it. But he is risen, right? Say, he is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. That's right. There is this song by Horatio, Horatio, Horatio Spafford. And I'm just going to read a little tiny bit of it. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet and trial should come, let the blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless state and shed his own blood for my soul. All is well. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. But we know, my brothers and sisters, as Julian of Norwich lived in the 14th century, reflecting on her life and the difficulties and challenges and the rebellion taking place in her country and the breakdown of society and the black death reigning. And she said, it will be well with my soul as I struggle through these days. So we know at the same time, right? It is well with my soul and we know it will be well with my soul. We look forward to the day that it is well with my soul. We look forward to the day that we live the empty tomb, that that is our tomb that is empty, that we have been raised from the dead. St. Paul knew it. He knew the war rages, but it has been won. We must know the war has been won. The war has been won. When St. Paul went around proclaiming the message that the tomb is empty, that Christ is risen, there was those that accepted the message and those that rejected it. Why? Because you had the pagan temples. You had the pagan festivals. You had the pride that raises its ugly head. You had the call for simple honesty and absolute forgiveness. And these things are difficult. And so those are reject Christ. And then we see around us, don't we? I'm not ignorant. You're not ignorant. I will say to you, the tomb is empty. Christ has won. Death has been defeated. But I know, I know that often I go to the cemetery. I know disease is real and hunger and thirst and bankruptcy and addiction and abortion and worry and spiritual disease and mental disease and heart disease and mistakes and regret and abandonment and denial and spitting and slapping and crowning with thorns and placing a sh cross on the shoulder. I know it's all real. And I have to say all will be well as I struggle now, but I know also he is risen and all is well. All is well with my soul. All is well as I live the new life in Christ. All is well. Why do some people respond to God's grace and some people do not? And some people pretend to. Why do some people pretend to believe in Jesus, pretend to worship him, pretend to know him? Why indeed? We'll have to ask God that question. Why indeed? And this is the verdict. The light came into the world, but people prefer darkness to light. 
because their works were evil. I heard it said like this, have you ever driven into the sun on early in the morning and the sun is low in the sky and you're driving on the highway and all of a sudden you can see all the bugs and all the mess and all the guts on your windshield. Have you ever had that experience? You hit the squirter and it squirts and you wipe and you say, oh, that was a mistake. <laughs> you're driving down the road. See, when we drive toward the light, we see the bugs and the guts and the slop of our life. And we have to be changed. So some people, instead of driving toward the light, just turn. Turn away so it's not so obvious. The light has come into the world, but some people prefer darkness to light. What do you prefer? the dark or the light. The light has come into the world. My brothers and sisters, do not turn away from the light. The light will call you to change. It will call you to be transformed. It will call you to spend your money differently, to spend your time differently, to spend your Sundays differently. The light has come into the darkness. You know, one of the things that I do as a, as a priest, I have a, you know, and it's not, people will sometimes, they'll say to me, I'll say, I have a funeral today. They'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, it's really not a big deal. I have there all the time, you know, it's all the time. I had four one week recently, you know. I read a lot of obituaries. It's part of my job. And you see people's lives summarized in one sentence or a paragraph. I'm reading a, a profound novel right now. And as the novel introduces new characters, the characters are dragged onto the stage of the novel and their lives are kind of, we, the, the author is introducing us to this character. And it's usually a really short summary of who they are. And I was thinking about it as I was reading character after character being introduced. I started asking, how would I be introduced? How would you summarize my life? How would you introduce me to the world or to eternity in one honest short paragraph? And I started thinking about that. And, and I'm going to give you one example of a character. Theodore was of noble birth but in a poor and dependent position. Through an unexpected marriage, he came into a small fortune, but he was a petty knave, a toady buffoon, a fairly good, though undeveloped intelligence. He became prosperous and then sarcastic and cynical. On the spiritual side, he was undeveloped. He saw nothing in life but his sensual pleasure. He had no feelings for his duty as a father. He ridiculed those duties. He left his children to his servants. He was happy to be rid of them. You know, that's a tough paragraph to be described as, isn't it? How would your paragraph look? An honest paragraph. And you know what's difficult about me asking you that question? I studied psychology and theology and spirituality long enough to know that the blinders of denial are so powerful. The capacity to see the bugs and the dirt on the windshield and just turn the other way where they're not so obvious. I ask myself often, why do some people come to Christ and some people do not? Why does the grace of God's life and love draw some and rejects others? I guess we'll have to ask God that in the end, won't we? But the light came into the world. And some people prefer darkness to light. What do you prefer? Jesus Christ, the light of the world that shines into our hearts. 
Herod, the great King Herod at the birth of Jesus, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. He assembled the chief priests and the scribes and he inquired of them, where's the Christ to be born? They told him in Bethlehem. He sent wise men to Bethlehem and said, go and search for the child diligently. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may go worship him. And it was all a lie, wasn't it? Herod wanted to find the Christ child to put out the light. How was Joseph, a Verim how was Joseph the carpenter described in the Bible? His biography would be much shorter or his uh, obituary. It said he was a righteous man. And St. Paul, St. Paul, he said, I am the foremost of sinners. I am not worthy to be an apostle. I am the least of the apostles. I have persecuted the church. St. Paul knew himself, but he would later say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So Paul was becoming, Paul was being transformed. Paul was being changed by the light. My brothers and sisters, the light has come into the darkness and the darkness and has not overcome it. And what about Judas? He was a believer. He was an apostle. He was a thief. He was a traitor. He was a murderer. And St. Peter, he was an apostle. He was a leader. He was arrogant. He was a failure. He was humble. He was a leader. He was a martyr. What is your story? And the light has come into the darkness and the tomb is, is, is empty and he has risen. Last night, I had the privilege to baptize five and bring about 25 into the Catholic Church. It was beautiful to have this front of the church filled with people making their profession of faith. And I said to them what St. Paul said to the Corinthians, I remind you, brothers and sisters of the gospel I preach to you, in which you have received, in which you now stand, through it you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I handed on to you as first importance what I received, that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. He is risen. You know, Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a lived life. It's not about hearing a sermon or a recital or the choir. It's about bending the knee. It's about loving your neighbor. It's about being transformed by grace. I wish I could tell you about it. I wish I could. I know. I know to you skeptics out there, there is disease and hunger and thirst and addiction and worry and disease and mental illness and heart disease. I know there's spitting and slapping and crowning with thorns. I know there's falling under the weight of the cross, but I know he's alive. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All is well. All is well with my soul. All will be well. I'm reminding you of the gospel that has been preached. Why do some believe and some do not and some pretend? I don't know. We'll have to ask God that question, right? But today, ask for the grace of faith. Ask that you may believe. It's the greatest gift anyone can ever give themselves or another. Jesus Christ, the light has come into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it.